So hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Christine Spoler, and I am, among other jobs in life, the climate labor editor for the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. Now, uh, to, just to give a few basic facts about what we are doing today, Miguel Dobrich is an award-winning journalist and educator and digital entrepreneur from Uruguay. And he will be explaining uh, the Pulitzer funded uh, project that he did and the investigative reporting he did on climate change and how it affects life in Montevideo. Um, and I will start and then I will give a few basic facts about the Pulitzer Center and Miguel will follow up uh, later on in the webinar. So who are we? Well, the Pulitzer Center is not the Pulitzer Prize. Just so you know, if you get a grant, you are not a Pulitzer Prize winner, but it is the same family uh, with different parts of the family funding um, grants and journalism opportunities for you to be able to do the kind of reporting you really wanna do. The Pulitzer Center started about 15 years ago as a small foundation to help journalists report in the field on undercovered stories. So what's an undercovered story? Well, they can be regional in nature, you see the effects around you, but they are potentially big in impact and particularly big in your ambition regarding the reporting. Why are we giving you money? Well, you might not have the funds to travel or to harvest data in the way you, you would like to do, or you might not have the time to do the story in the field the way you would want. The Pulitzer Fund today, and, and it is quite a robust foundation today, gives you money meant to cover what you can't and allow you to work the best and do your best work. In these times, it's clear that freelance salaries have dwindled and we are very aware of that, but we don't pay for salaries. We pay for all the other things that make you worry. We help you concentrate on the reporting. So why am I here and what is my role? Well, I received my first Pulitzer grant when I was the investigations editor of the Financial Times in London. I realized there were big investigations and accountability stories that I wanted to do, and we just didn't have the money to travel or to do them in the way that I wanted to. So I will give you two short examples. In 2013, we did something called the Austerity Audit. And in 2015, we did something called the Land Rush Series. Both turned out to be big and award-winning, and the Pulitzer money made that possible. The austerity audit more than 10 years ago was an attempt to project what would all the austerity cuts in the British budget do to places outside London. At the time, we did not have a data staff, which tells you something, and at the time, we didn't have much multimedia capacity. Part of why I was hired, I have a background in foreign reporting and investigations in business, and at that time I was pretty digitally savvy. So I appealed to Pulitzer and asked for money to hire a data team from a local university and to buy off the shelf scrolling display capability. Now, everybody scrolls on your phone with apps now and you read big consequential stories that way. That did not exist at the FT at the time. So I was doing two things with my Pulitzer money. I was creating some new and important reporting at the FT and I was inviting Pulitzer to support innovation. That turned out to be a, an important newsroom-wide project, and we received $20,000 from Pulitzer. The same thing happened with the Land Rush series. We, had, we saw climate and business then as an issue, and we put three reporters on the story, and we did a project, big projects out of India and Ethiopia, that explored what effects climate change would be having on some pivotal businesses there. We saw climate as a force to be reckoned with, both in living standards and productivity and the greater economy of Europe. So I used Pulitzer strategically. Every September, the FT basically ran out of travel money during my era there. And every August, I put in a request to Pulitzer for five years, over a five year period I was funded, for a project that I had well planned and I had budgeted very well. I knew how to budget. So um, the series that we did on Land Rush, that won prizes, uh, best in business in the British Press Awards. And I learned I could use Pulitzer to do what I could not. I could fund essential travel to do a story that the paper would support and want it, but just didn't have the money for. 
which brings me to explaining what our work environment fund does. Uh, Pulitzer asked me to take on this initiative in 2022, and maybe we could see the first slide introducing the, um, the fund in Tan. Um, when Pulitzer asked me to take on this initiative, it had received money specific to climate and labor reporting. Pulitzer had done research that showed that there were plenty of climate disaster stories, but few stories that looked at the people most affected over time, that is the workers. So what is that all about? The initiative overview, and that this next slide please, seeks to support reporting projects and activities that explore the climate-induced risks playing out for workers in fields, factory floors, and other climate-affected work workplaces. We are interested in reporting and in outreach activities that help explore the vulnerabilities of workers and communities and solutions for the future of work in a changing, uh, in a changing climate. Journalists who want to report on these issues can apply for support from the Pulitzer Center, pulitzercenter.org. There is no deadline for applications. You can apply anytime. You must come to us with a news outlet ready to publish your story and willing to credit Pulitzer as a funder. So since 2022, Pulitzer has supported dozens of reporting projects, which were published in global and regional news outlets in Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the United States. This year, we're particularly uh, interested and in welcoming to labor and business-focused stories. We expect and hope you would like to, uh, as grantees, participate in webinars and other outreach programs. Next slide. So what types of stories are we interested? We want all formats, print, video, radio, and digital. And we want you to innovate, if you can, uh, particularly on social media. But most importantly, the reporting must highlight an underreported climate labor issue. So I, I encourage you to look at the Pulitzer Center site to see what stories we've done, both for environment and climate. You don't wanna be repetitious to, to the ideas we've already explored. Consider how workers or jobs will be affected and how workers, companies, or governments are reacting, adapting, or not being accountable to their own laws. What stories have not been told? The big issues, next slide please, the just energy transition. How are workers trained for new jobs? And what does the shift to clean energy look like for workers? Are there plans? Are there retraining programs? Detail the economics of the issue, drill down into it. Think of race, gender, and climate justice as factors to follow. The green supply chain, what is happening to supply chains and the laws that protect workers. Explain if companies are being held accountable by existing laws or if there's some new need, new, if there is some need for new regulations. Uh, particularly, are the existing laws being followed and why not? Heat and health, find a way to document heat and explain what that means for workers. Is kidney disease rising from heat stress? That's a big one. Are hospital or health systems facing new challenges from heat related needs? And the business sector, explain how companies are responding or not and adapting to climate change. Are there investments that are driving some practices? Has it changed in the past two years? I am hearing from investment, investment uh, firms that yes, like there's more investment for climate change. Are the investors applying AI? Are the companies, are there science-backed solutions that companies are using to maintain their profit margin and workplace productivity? So some of the story examples. We have in the past year uh, had magazine covers and uh, broadcasts uh, both in all sorts of news outlets, both TV and uh, in news. Next slide, please. Some of the stories we tracked, uh, Time Magazine did a great story on severe heat related illnesses with the World Cup construction workers. And the World Cup construction workers were in Qatar, not necessarily working on the stadium, but in 
all sorts of hotels and other uh, construction sites ancillary to the to the games. And our reporter uh, from Time Magazine followed them back to Nepal, where many of them had kidney disease and have lifelong kidney, kidney disease. And that is a burden for them personally, but also for the government. And what do you do now with all these people with disease uh, that is long lasting? The coal transition challenge. Uh, we had a series in South Africa done by Oxpecker's investigative group that is really digging down into what is a major coal transition there. We just had in the past few weeks, um, a very, uh, it's just a fascinating look at can India, in fact, do the transition, make the transition from coal to alternative energies. And the reporter there um, really focused on women and women in the field, because there are a lot of women working in coal fields and digging up coal with their hands. It's fascinating film. Rising sea levels, reducing fishing hauls, and altering livelihoods in Nigeria and Ghana. And we had two reporters work together, one in Ghana, one in Nigeria, and publish in two different sites there about what was happening with fishing communities. Uh, next slide, please. So let's go over again what we support. We'll support travel expenses related to reporting, transport, lodging, meals, communications, you need extra phones, security, visa fees. Fees for people who you need to work with you to make your story the best it can be. Do you need a translator? Do you need a cameraman? Do you need a data person? And we don't pay for reporting equipment, but we will pay for rentals. Uh, fees related to investigative reporting, which we do want to support. Document and data research collection, translation, transcription services, particularly if you're working with video. Um, next slide, please. What we don't support, and and I and you have to be careful on this in your application, and and be uh, really look at your budget and see if you're if you're fitting within the parameters. We do not pay for people to talk to us or to you. So fees for sources or fees for illegally obtained information, data, or records, we don't pay for. And we don't want you to do that. Uh, purchase of equipment, we don't pay for. Rentals are okay. Salaries. Projects should have strong distribution plans. So if you submit a project and you say, I'm thinking of reaching out to, to you know, such and such outlet, uh, do more than think. Have a commitment letter from them saying that we will uh, run this story. We know this, the quality of the reporting this reporter does. And uh, we also have a distribution plan. We, we want to encourage the use of social media to extend the reach of the story and expand it. So next slide, please. Uh, how to apply. I think it's pretty straightforward and Miguel can talk to this point. It's a 250 word proposal that explains the story. Why is this relevant? How will you report? Who will you talk to? And why are you the person to do this? A distribution and publication plan. I've spoken about that earlier. A line item budget for travel and related expenses. You have to be specific here. You know, Don't say travel $600, lodging $1,000. For what and when? And when are you gonna be traveling? Your CV references and work samples. And again, a commitment letter from an outlet that will publish your work and you should review with them that, that, that Pulitzer will be credited. And the next slide, please. So thank you. And here are some tips for writing proposals. Uh, I think we will give you this slide in a follow-up email because then you can see um, one is a video and one is a uh, uh, easy kind of checklist of things you need to do. And I strongly, strongly recommend that you look at the website and you read some of the stories so you know exactly who has been successful in getting a grant. And the next slide, please. And these are examples, again, that I think are helpful for you to see uh, a video and also uh, a long form story that um, both both grantees produced excellent work. So thank you very much. And now um, it's my pleasure to introduce Miguel Dobrich, who is based in Uruguay 
and has been um, uh, a much honored uh, data journalist. He is editor of Amenaza Roboto, if I said that correctly, you will Correct me, Miguel, I'm sure. Uh, and he is the CEO of Dogcast, which is a uh, platform for YouTube videos. Uh, Miguel, we are so uh, excited to have you in this session because Miguel has already won prizes for what he did with us, but he is award-winning for other data and um, data-based investigations in Uruguay. Um, I'm not going to go any further. He's a lecturer uh, and much esteemed researcher in his country, and I will let him describe the project, which he did by proposing to look at how will Uruguay be changed, pivotal industries in Uruguay, transportation, schools, hospitals, how will they be affected by flooding related to climate change? And um, he recently won an award from the World Bank for data visualization in Uruguay for really exceptional display and communication of uh, through data and with visuals on what the threat is. Miguel, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It is an honor. Thank you so much for your words. I'm going to share my slides with all of you. So, okay. Um, as Christine said, my name is Miguel Dobric. And I'm the editor in chief of Amenaza Roboto. And we basically cover tech and science. We produce podcasts, video series, we do interviews. But what I'm most proud of is that we run the So Climate and Data Vertical in my country, Uruguay. Uh, we founded this in 2022 uh, with this story, The Submerged City. And it was the first time that journalists and scientists collaborate to uh, basically analyze using floodline projections how four areas of Montevideo, the capital city of Uruguay, will be affected by climate change. Um, we won a Sigma award because of that. And this investigation led the foundations that let us basically do what we do. Is, uh, we, we try to work with open data to serve different communities of Uruguay. So as you all know, climate change is reshaping the lives of workers across the world. And thanks to this amazing grant. And it's not amazing because uh, of the money, which is super important. It is amazing because you have the chance to work with Christine, which was an amazing mentor in this whole process. For the first time in my life, I had the chance to focus on, on these stories for six months. And that was something that I've never done, as I told you. So what we did is the more um, like uh, challenging and complex project that we've ever done at Amenaza Roboto, from drought to floods. We published this story in Spanish, Portuguese, and English. And um, we work basically with open data, satellite images, and LIDAR. And this reporting project analyzes governmental open databases on climate, socioeconomic, geographic, and satellite data to obtain information on the impact of climate on the population and their employment, with emphasis on three vulnerable groups, domestic workers, commuters, and artisanal official folks. So we basically work on three different areas of Uruguay. Um, this is the southern part of Uruguay, the coastal zone, where seven out of 10 people live in Uruguay. And um, we work in Barra de Balizas with artisanal fisher folks, which is three hours and a half away from where I live. And we also work in Ciudad del Plata, which is an hour and 15 minutes maybe uh, from where I live. And uh, so we basically build a multicultural and multidisciplinary team with journalists. Um, shout out to Gabriel Farias, who's an amazing data journalist. Uh, with scientists as uh, Natalia Webb and Nahuel Lamas. You see, we work with uh, talent from Uruguay, Argentina, Mexico, Chile, and uh, we had amazing, amazing translators from the US and also Brazil. And we also collaborated with uh, the Uruguayan Air Force, which let us play with this gear. Uh, there you can see in your left um the the lidar uh 
which is an amazing technology. I will show you the, the results of what we did with them and with this technology. We used 21 open data sets from the Uruguayan government and four data sets created by us for this project. Our investigation was also based on 13 interviews conducted by us and 19 national and regional documentary sources. As I told you, we used satellite images from Google and Planet Labs. We created our own maps. And in our GitHub account, you can access um, Amenaza Robotos LiDAR data and raw files. So we work on three stories, quicksand, which was in Balizas, as I told you, where uh, extreme drought affected the lives of fisher folks. And this was something uh, that, that blew our mind uh, because uh, there's no register of an event like this in the history of our country. Um, so we use uh, satellite images to um, show and analyze how the drought was affecting. Uh, basically, um, the stream was disconnected from the ocean. So there was a, a super low level of uh, water there. And fisher folks were uh, fishing illegally uh, before the season because they were afraid that um, the shrimps would die because of the lack of water and, and, and food. So this promising season was basically a disaster. You can see the small sizes of, of the shrimps at the photo. In Montevideo, we focus on climate change, mobility, and inequality. And, and this is the basic statement. The lives of domestic workers in Montevideo could be affected by the impact of climate change and climate variability. At risk is a fundamental factor in achieving a certain level of well-being and reducing vulnerability, mobility. So we examined, we carried out a geoprocessing analysis using geographic information systems and crossing the data sets, the databases of the population census with the urban transport lines of Montevideo municipality and the flood line published by the Ministry of Environment. So uh, we could uh, project how um, their commuting will be affected by um, the projected flood lines. Um, and uh, basically, uh, we concluded that uh, they will have more commuting time to go from home to work, impact on family life and caregiving. And this would be some of the consequences of climate change in the daily lives of domestic workers in Montevideo who reside in flood prone areas of the city. We try to use different techniques to serve different communities in each story. With Commuter Town, um, we basically focus on Ciudad del Plata because a large part of the population will be affected by the flooding projected by the Ministry of Environment due to climate change. And we use LIDAR technology, which is something that we uh, have never done before the support of Pulitzer. And, um, so we work in this city, which is a beautiful city that had population growth. I mean, according to the census data, this suburb grew 808% between 1963 and 2011. And according to the director of the National Institute of Statistics, um, they had the, we had the latest census last year and we have a leap, like an explosive growth in the area. And as I said, the Ministry of Environment projects that a large part of this area could potentially be flooded as sea level rise, affecting the lives of a large, large part of the population in this commuter town. And so here you can see how the numbers are the population. You can see the flood line projections. And this is um, how we used to present um, data information, but, uh, this investigation allowed us not only to visualize how many residents uh, will be affected by flooding, but also how their homes will be affected. And I'm gonna share some screen captures because uh, using LiDAR, we were able to create 3D models to see with precision uh, where um, the water would hit schools, uh, houses, factories. So we were able to identify the height of the water levels on the beach during ridges, natural reserves, industrial areas, and uh, educational facilities. So here you can see how you recreate um, 
This is a school in Ciudad del Plata. This is a 3D model that if you enter to our website, you may see it uh, animated. So you will see how um, the water basically takes a great part of the city. You can see the factories. I mean, it is quite shocking. Um, regarding what Christine said, we, uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna share like a, a, a ridiculous example, but uh, whenever we do a story, we always think about the distribution and how uh, we can have impact because if we don't have impact, our stories won't help the communities that we're covering. So we are really active um, on um, collaborating uh, with other journalists. And uh, for example, we presented our work at the most important regional uh, open data conference, Abre la Tam and Condatos. Um, like many media outlets uh, in Uruguay and in neighbor countries share uh, what we did because we not only use open data, we share our methodology and we would love if other journalists um, reuse our data sets and go beyond what we do. Uh, we don't have uh, like a no school mindset. We, as I said, we share our methodology and we really look forward to other journalists uh, going beyond what we do. Um, local channels uh, did stories uh, regarding what we did. And even the uh, Deutsche Welle team uh, flew from Germany uh, to do a story based partially on our investigation. We are always uh, open and keen to collaborate with students. We presented our work to um, master students from um, Colombia and Paraguay. Our work was, so, was also a case study in City London University. So we also um, gather uh, with this journalist. Um, this year, El Armiguero, which is the most uh, relevant um, study on digital media outlets in Latin America, uh, will focus on Amenaza Roboto uh, in Uruguay. And we won um, the World Bank uh, and Visualization Award, which was amazing. We had the chance, which still blows my mind, to present our work in Tokyo, Japan, to the data team of the Asahi Shimbun, which was basically a dream. It was an amazing day of work. We also were a couple of days ago, that's why maybe I'm uh, way too slow and tired. We were in Thailand, uh, where we share our work with journalists from the UK, Thailand, um, Australia, Indonesia. It was really great to, to collaborate, share, and also learn from our peers and see what other journalists that are supported by Pulitzer were doing. And, and I want to emphasize that if you have a GitHub account, or, or even if you don't have one, you can look for Amenaza Roboto there, and you may um, use our data sets, learn about our methodology. And uh, sorry for my broken English, I try my best. Let's keep in touch. You can always reach out, and I gladly uh, try to help you. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. What a what a great presentation. And uh, Miguel, kind words from you. Thank you so much. But Miguel is really an extraordinary grantee. Uh, and I think you will see um, as you try putting together your own project, he has his project included people he trusts, he knows, he understands uh, his skill set and their skill set. And it is really about a collaborative effort to bring the best out of each of you when you're on a project. Uh, I always try to encourage grantees um, to talk to each other about, you know, what's out there, what are what are the gaps and shortfalls in data? You know, different governments, different countries have have uh, have data roles that uh, some are very lacking. And um, I was got in a discussion with uh, somebody from India and they had very good um, heat laws until COVID happened. And then 
the heat loss are not being enforced. So at least at the time I talked to the person, I haven't been updated in the past few months, but that that is the kind of issue you want to hear uh, you know, from other reporters who you might collaborate with across borders. So uh, again, thank you so much, Miguel. It was, it was a fascinating uh, presentation. So I just thank want to see if, <laughs> uh, I see we have people from uh, listeners and, and journalists from, and photographers, I see from India and from Jakarta, uh, Malaysia. I see somebody from Italy. Uh, does anybody have questions? I, I see a lot of hellos. I'm not seeing some questions, but we just finished the, um, you know, the, the presentation. So I understand you might still be thinking. Um, and I do want to emphasize that what constitutes a successful proposal is really thinking through uh, what are the issues in your region or in the city that are, are very important there, but also resonate. And I think what Miguel did by looking at industries and places of work that will be affected, uh, he, he got great interest from ministries there and from people of power and authority in your, in your home region. And it made people from Japan say, well, maybe we could do the same thing here, right? So uh, Miguel, did you get immediate response from ministries? I know we had a grantee in Paraguay who had looked at the heat stress on delivery workers, uh, you know, people who deliver your food, your food apps, they're, they're delivering, and she hooked them up with, uh, you know, the electronic equipment that could get their wet, wet bulb temperature, the true, you know, heat temperature that they were experiencing. And as soon as she published, she heard from the Ministry of Labor and the Ministry of Health. They they wanted to at least talk to her. I'm not sure if they wanted the data, but they they were very interested in what she found. Have have you seen something similar? Yes, uh, we had the chance to meet with uh, teams from the Ministry of Environment, which were interested in this. Uh, the Ciudad del Plata story also was really impactful um, because many local media outlets um, used what we did and they pressured, we have not um, governors, but intendentes. Uh, so the intendente, which is a lady, um, had to reevaluate um, the investment and infrastructure there. Um, we also had impact on how the um, formats of the open databases that the government shares, they had to work to better how they're presented because the formats and the weight of the files were crazy. You, basically, you needed to have, for some data sets, had uh, NASA uh, computers to process that, uh, but um, they were super open to our feedback and, and they changed that. So yes, uh, we uh, whenever we we publish a story regarding to climate change, uh, we had the chance to to have uh, critical uh, discussions with the authorities. I mean, uh, everything is not peachy. I mean, there's some tension there, but but they have been uh, pretty useful, and also we. We try to explain uh, the communities that we that we focus on. Uh, what can they uh, do better? For example, if another drought hit them, I mean, the impact. I mean, if there's not positive impact on the communities that we serve, we're doing our, our work really, really bad. Because I truly believe that journalism. It's a service, and and that's uh, our like north always. Yeah, it, it, I want to emphasize: we give you the money. We re I I read your proposal. I I think we spoke on the phone before you you uh, received the money, and um, and how it works is you get half the funding at the time you're accepted, and half at the very end once you're published. So don't expect to get it all at once. But it is totally independent money. And so I'm aware of what Miguel is doing. I'm interested and I'm asking for updates every few weeks just to know that he's progressing. But he is making 
the decision on the ground about uh, problems he uh, uh, finds. I I've had grantees reach out to me and say, oh my gosh, this isn't turning out what I, what I thought it would, what do I do now? I I'm a pretty experienced project editor. So I'll say, okay, I would strategize this way, see if this works. I am not directing anybody in how they are researching this. Miguel, can you talk about the independence that you, that you have in going forward with your story? Well, I have total independence, and uh, I really love uh, how you work, Christine, because uh, you you gave us room. You always trusted our process. Uh, we we talked many times, and uh, we had some hypotheses. For example, at first we wanted to work. UI doesn't have states; we have departamentos. So uh, Balizas is at the Departamento of Rocha, and we were planning on focusing on Punta del Diablo, which is another uh, fisher town, but, and, and we had all figured it out, we had the plans, but as soon as we started processing the data, it wasn't Punta del Diablo. We needed to work on balizas. So we were able to, to update that. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's no micromanaging at all. We were totally, totally uh, independent. And uh, and it was a joy because uh, you always gave amazing feedback. And uh, I, I don't know if this happens to, to other uh, grantees, but it's the field of the sender. So I, I felt pressure. I wanted to do the best I could. So. Uh, we were super um, rigorous with, with the planning and it was uh, easy, of course. I would have loved to work for another six months, <laughs> but you always need to, to, to publish. And uh, so we deliver. We try to, basically. Miguel, did you fail at any point? Because I, I, I think it's important for people to know that you can have missteps. Uh, did you fail at any point? How did you recover? I had one grantee call me from the field one time and said, oh, no, I, I've done this wrong and I can't. And I'm like, OK, this is when you figure out how to do it. This is a growth period for you. Here, here's several options, my friend, the grantee, yes. and you will figure this out, right? So can you speak to failing or possibly failing? Yes, of course, I failed many times, not only in the story, in many stories and many times in my life. But we had uh, plenty of uh, of challenging times uh, because this was the first time that we uh, worked with LIDAR and uh, we never considered that the weather conditions would affect the models that we were trying to build. So if it was windy and it's super windy here in autumn and winter, it was all a mess. We couldn't use uh, the models that we were trying to to, to build. Uh, we uh, broke a uh, drone uh, uh, working uh, with the story of Ciudad del Plata. At first, we were uh, focusing only on um, features. But as soon as we started processing the data, we saw that like most of the workers there, the population, not only the workers there, would be affected by flooding uh, in less than 80 years from now. So yes, we, we, we had to recalculate and uh, we, it was stressful, but we, we solved that uh, basically by, by working as we are a small media outlet, or maybe a nano media outlet, we are super small. Um, we um, always try to build on what we did before. So we learn a lot from our previous investigation. And we also learn from each of the stories that, that we were doing. So yes, uh, we, we made mistakes, but we solved them. And, and, and whenever you have... Yeah, that's Whenever being an investigator. A, a, yes, yeah. and if you have the chance to to work with an editor, as Christine, she uh, she trusts in you. So you think, okay, I'm not crazy. I can do it. 
So yeah, we did. Um, we're we're getting a couple questions, and and I I believe somebody is asking me is the final decision based on the newsroom that's that's uh, cooperating or con or going to take your uh, project, or is it based on the story angle from the reporter? Let me let me kind of parse that a little bit. Um, we want uh, at, and we welcome applications from freelancers. We welcome applications from newsrooms. We welcome applications from freelancers who are tied to a newsroom, a regular contributor. Um, we give you the decision based on whether we think the story can be done, whether you are the best person to do that story, and whether it will get published. Uh, we want these stories uh, to be successful, both for you, but also for the greater journalism community. So I, I'm hoping I answered that question. And if I didn't, please ask, please ask it again. I also have a question from um, oh, a journalist from Madrid who is asking, if, would we support freelance reporting in the global north? Yes. Uh, I had a story last year on Greenland, and I just had another application for a story from Greenland, and they looked at how the economy there is changing and what jobs are, are uh, disappearing uh, or, you know, coming anew. You know, I, I'm I'm very interested in the shift in the economy shift for countries. Like, what are the jobs that are going to be there uh, if petroleum becomes less of an extractive uh, occupation for people? Well, are there jobs in solar? Are there jobs in other, uh, you know, alternative fuels that people need to get educated for or most likely trained? So, um, yeah, I'm interested in the global north. We were particularly interested in the global south in the in the first few years of this project, as climate change has changed, and as we see wildfires. My first year, there was a huge wildfire in Turkey, and uh, a very good reporter wrote a long story tracking how Turkey lost its pine honey crop, which is a pillar of its economy. China is the, is the uh, next producer of pine honey or the larger producer, Turkey second. Um, but last year we saw you know, wildfires in Canada. So uh, we're seeing climate change change and we want you to tell us where we should be with these stories. Um, I'd like to show what's happening I like to anticipate with our stories what where where we all need to be focused and what we need to worry about. So yes, we're all um, I'm very focused on worldwide issues. Global South is having uh, probably the most dramatic changes. So I'm happy for uh, both projects and journalists from there to be uh, to be receiving our grants. I'm just looking to see if there's, ah, is the angle climate change or heat a must in the story? Um, no, uh, there are different um, parts of the climate change uh, landscape that you can address. If If somebody had sent me a proposal this week about how insurance is changing uh, because of of uh, losses in farmland, losses in productivity and crops. We had one grantee uh, do a story from India looking at how fast the seasons were changing now in India. And that meant that farmers were not making the money that they used to, and they were moving around uh, much more uh, because of migration. And I see this person is saying, I need to investigate, or I'd like to investigate the climate change angle in a trend uh, with with migration. And that's that's a, uh, a very good angle. Last year, we also had a story uh, from Iraq showing how uh, workers, their farms were no longer viable and they were moving into cities. And that transformation, you see schools overwhelmed, you see cultural changes uh, in Southern Iraq. There are different traditions about getting healthcare, usually from male doctors rather than women doctors in, in Baghdad and other places, and there's plenty of women doctors. So there, you know, the cultural friction, uh, which you might not imagine from climate change uh, is real. And so how do, how do governments, how do uh, authorities adapt to that? And I'm just looking to see if there's a, Another question. 
yes, we are interested in climate change and health. Um, I, I think that's a very big issue. And um, and that, that can be interpreted in all kinds of ways. We saw the story in Time Magazine looked at uh, the burden, the personal burden that construction workers had who were very proud to work on the World Cup uh, construction sites. They were, and it was good money. But these were young men in their 30s who came down with renal disease and now have dialysis for the rest of their lives. That affects them, and that affects uh, you know their home country of Nepal. How do you how do you take care of that? And kidney disease is one of the largest uh, uh, health impacts of heat stress. So uh, yeah, we're very interested in that. Uh, the same reporter from Time, she did something very innovative. Uh, she decided to look at heat stress for delivery workers in the U.S. and then the UPS strike was going on and specific, the unions were asking for, you know, better air conditioning in their delivery vans. And she was also able to um, get the University of Georgia students uh, help her put on heat monitors on these workers. And the union agreed, the unions agreed that they would do that. We had the same kind of uh, reaching out by the journalists to unions in Paraguay. To, to have some cooperation so you can see in real time what the heat stress is. Um, but those are just two examples. Um, the Time Magazine correspondent was also, whose name is Aaron Baker, uh, was also able to coordinate with uh, Georgia Public Radio, Georgia Broadcasting, which has a public radio station in the US. And they also ran a story and uh, did some videos that now it's another outlet. So. With every step of her project, she was able to expand um, the reach. We approved the project for Time Magazine, knowing that she was going to be working with uh, the students. But we were always, you know, excited for you and for us if you can go further and add, you know, more outlets. So, a question: Does the do the approved proposals have to have a strong viewpoint? and support Western views such as clean energy transition and no more forestation or using parameters like that. Well, I, I, we have no parameters. <laughs> I, um, I am a longtime investigations editor and uh, working both in business and health. And, um, you know, my best day as an editor is when you tell me everything you told me is wrong, Christine, because I've done the research and this is how the story should be framed. Convince me. I'm, I'm happy to be convinced. I am always happy to be wrong. But I, what it takes is some rigorous proposals. And um, as Miguel knows, the more data you have, the more you can prove your case. I, I do want to say Miguel is, um, and is a very experienced person with data. You shouldn't be intimidated by what he has been able to do. Um, I do see younger reporters, less experienced reporters coming in with smaller projects, and I'm happy to encourage that. Uh, for me, you know, journalism is a lifelong career, and it's a, there's a learning curve to everything. So step by step, and I think, Miguel, perhaps you could talk about this. I mean, step by step, you get better in this field. Yes, uh, I wouldn't think of myself as a, a data journalist. I, I would present myself only as a journalist. Uh, data journalism is super underdeveloped in my country. Um, I work with Gabriel Farias, who's an amazing uh, data journalist. But as we don't have what you may have in the US or even Spain, Spain Argentina, or Brazil, um, what we try to do like really fast is to learn from the best so we don't repeat the mistakes that they had to go through. So for example, in our first story, um, we talked with uh, amazing peers from the markup, uh, the Washington Post, from uh, media outlets from Argentina, from Chile. As uh, we don't have uh, a data visualization culture here in Uruguay, what we did is so how can we solve this? Uh, maybe we can uh, collaborate with a geologist and a designer. So as uh, maybe I'm too old, and this reference is nothing to all of you, but MacGyver, it, if I may use the surname MacGyver as a verb. 
So we figured that out and, and we are always studying, always uh, testing uh, new tools to, as I said, uh, better serve our communities. So um, we are a super small media outlet. We were able to do uh, complex data stories. And if we did it, I'm sure you can do it. And if we can help in any way, reach out. And that is one thing that the Pulitzer site has. We do share methodologies on the site for different verticals that we have, whether it's environmental investigations, uh, climate. And I want to emphasize my fund is climate labor. We're really looking at the workplace. Uh, if you go on the Pulitzer site, you will see all sorts of funds. We have an ocean fund. We have a, you know, a governance and a transparency fund. We have a coastline fund uh, for the U.S. in particular. So, you know, look at, apply as you would apply. Apply with the proposal you have. Don't worry about what grant it is fitting, though it's helpful for you to look at those grants to see how we think. But when we go through the proposal process, we review every week, and I choose the ones that are apparently climate and work related climate business and others you know sometimes uh, somebody else will read one and say christine i think it's for you or i'll say to the other editor i think it's a health story more than a climate story so we trade back and forth on how we evaluate or who evaluates uh someone is asking if you pitch a story you have to do a lot of research and that in involves resources and sometimes finances um so, but there's almost so much time you can spend as a freelancer. Well, I suggest that you can do an awful lot of research uh, online and you can talk to people and, and exchange emails with them. And I say this because as I introduced uh, this session, the working for the climate fund at Pulitzer Center is one of many jobs I have. I've had a, a career in journalism. I freelance. I freelance on health issues. I freelance on all sorts of issues. So I understand your pain. And I also understand, you know, it's a matter of organization. So yeah, I I, I deal with this all the time. And I, um, even with some applications, I will advise people um, if they reach out to me, like, I'm not going to tell you what your story is. And if somebody somebody contacted me one time and said, well, what story do you want? And I'm like, I, I, that's not my job. You tell me what is the story that you think is the best one there. I, I often encourage people to report on, whether you use the word investigate or not, it's the to examine an issue that you think is important uh, people call themselves investigative reporters, and I don't really know what that means. That means that that's the title your boss gave you, but you're a reporter, right? And you should have a pretty wide skill set on how to uh, pursue questions about an issue that you think is important in your region, in your society. So I don't want to direct that, though I'm always happy when I read proposals to wonder how this person thinks. Uh, when I interview people for jobs, I'm really interviewing you to understand, well, how do they think? How do they pull apart ideas? And I can help you do that. And the, the Pulitzer process, I think, in the proposal, again, I am not helping you once you get that money, I get that funding, but um, it is helpful in the proposal process to show why you think this is important and how and what your thought process is. Um, Miguel, do you have anything to add to that? Because, you know, your proposal was so strong. Yes, but I must say, uh, to be totally honest, is that when you have a, an interview uh, with Christine, she she will zoom in. I mean, you have to be ready. You have to, you have, to have a strong proposal. You have to do research. I mean... The, the kind of questions that you do, uh, uh, it challenges you um, and it helps you to, to think the project through. So um, having the chance to discuss ideas with you, it, it is an amazing opportunity. I mean, I know that you all, got, all of you are thinking about the amount of money, uh, but I think that 
of course, the money is important, but having the chance to collaborate with Christine and with the Pulitzer team, it is an, an amazing opportunity. It's, it has been one of the uh, greatest uh, achievements of, of my life, uh, if I may. I'm not exaggerating. I mean, I, I learned a lot, and uh, it is uh, a super generous team that um, wants you to do the best story you can. And really, this is the, the spirit. They, they are um, betting on you. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. We're betting on you. And I'm also betting on you being as creative you, as you can be. I'm, I'm American, if you can't tell, and I'm, which makes me very direct. And I, which is part of the, the questioning process, I guess, that I, I'm, I have some pretty direct questions. But I also, um, you know, I've done this for a long time, and I'm also very aware of not knowing what I don't know. And that's part of the process is helping you like, well, did you think of this? And did you think of this? And did you think of this? That doesn't mean we're going to say no. It's just we want you to challenge yourself. That's, you know, that's what the money is for, for you to be as creative as you can be. Someone is asking, do you prefer to fund smaller projects? Uh, I, I think they're asking $3,000 or bigger ones. I prefer to fund what you need. If it's a video, you're probably going to need over uh, a certain, over $8,000 potentially uh, because there's uh, issues with the finishing process. Um, the travel and finishing process, I'm sorry, post-production of film, that, that adds money to it. Um, if And if you're doing both a long form and a video story, that's probably more. If you are, sim not simply, but if you are doing a reporting story, that's probably travel. So and if it's in your region, maybe you need a thousand dollars. You know, it it just depends on your newsroom, what you're capable of doing, and what you how many platforms you want to be on. Miguel, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just wanted to to clarify one thing is that um, Christine also helps you. It, it not only challenges you uh, regarding, for example, the budget, because there are many questions regarding the budget, but uh, the spirit is not to cut resources, it's to give you resources. So she may even challenge you uh, to correct some numbers because she has the experience. Uh, so she, she may say, no, you, you might need this amount and not this amount. Um, so you shouldn't be worrying in my experience about um, shortening the budget. You should budget what you need. And Pulitzer will give you feedback, but you should be totally honest and um, and tidy. You know, you, you need to plan, as as she said before. If you need to travel, for example, uh, we need to go plenty of times to Balisas, which is three hours and a half away from where we live. Which might not sound uh, crazy if you live in a large country, but here is a lot. So we needed to figure that out. Should we stay in a hotel? Can we go and, and come back again to Montevideo in the same day? Uh, um, the photographer, Matilde Campolónico, which is amazing, she needs to be there for three days. So um, Pulitzer helps you to deliver the best story you can. So you, you shouldn't uh, try to cut the budget, lie with the budget. Like Be honest and uh, they'll help you. We, we are very concerned with safety. And particularly if you're traveling, yeah, I, I have gone back to, actually Pulitzer and one of my efforts at the FT came back to me and said, you're sending, where are you sending this person that he's, it's $70 a night for a hotel. And, you know, we, we had our budget really cramped that year. And I said, oh, I think he, he thinks he can do it. And they were like, get a hotel with a good phone line. And with locks on the door, where where are you sending people? And we kind of laughed. And I went back to the reporters at the FT and said, like, you know, get a better hotel. And and we just laughed among ourselves that we were scrimping so so much that Pulitzer thought we were, you know, uh, doing it too far. And we do want you to be safe. We uh, do want you. Uh, I have sent people into conflict zones and out. And um you know, I've just said when they come out, I want them staying in a nice hotel with good food and recovering. So like, 
you know, if it's going to be $200, $250 the day out of coming out of somewhere, that's fine. You know, I think we're pretty rational and reasonable. We've, uh, the editors who judge these um, projects at Pulitzer, uh, we've all been foreign correspondents at times. Um, we've all been editors. Uh, so we're used to budgeting and we know what's realistic. Um, somebody is asking me, is it mandatory to travel for a story or can you write about a story which is in our city? Of, of course you can stay there. It, you don't have to. What we want is not a feature story that you could do uh, a one-off feature story. We would like to see a continuum of an approach to climate that informs, like Miguel has done, uh, informs his career and his approach to how he is reporting this. So uh, one-off features, the kinds of things that we we would reject. Uh, the range of awards given in dollars, I, I have funded somebody for $800 in a country where that goes very far. And I have funded somebody for $20,000 for a video on a major news site. And it had to be of a certain quality. So um, again, uh, don't pad it miscellaneous being a quarter of your uh, budget because that would be uh, that would be a red flag to me. Uh, sometimes I will call people if I think that the uh, the project is good, but the person hasn't explained themselves that well. And uh, sometimes I call, I will call on budgets a lot, but I sometimes will call just to have a conversation. And it doesn't mean you're getting it and it doesn't mean you're not getting it. It just means that I, I'm seeing something there I'm interested in, I think could be interesting. And I just, I need some help in making the judgment. Uh, someone has asked, um, I've experienced several previous incidents where I've done research, contacted potential sources, and in the end, the proposal was rejected. So then I felt uncomfortable with the communication I made to the sources. They started to wonder if I was serious about working on a particular story while my proposal was rejected. Is it better to research first without contacting potential sources because the possibility of the proposal being rejected. Well, I, I think you need to research first, right? You need to you need to read everything that's out there on the issue what you want to report. I have had people send in proposals for stories that we just published very similar in the similar region in the past six months. Uh, that's why you were rejected. Uh, not anybody in particular, but that that's why we would reject you. Um, I feel your pain that I just did that on a story six months ago on, um, I wrote about firearm harm in the US. I had another big story, but I had a, a smaller story and I did several interviews and then the outlet didn't want the story. So yes, I felt bad about it. That happens. That's, um, yes, I, I feel your pain, but that is the cost of being a freelancer. So um, there's no way around it. Some, day, some days you win, some days you lose. Uh, let's see, I'm looking over at the questions. Um, I think we're, we're pretty good. So I, I do want to emphasize that if you get, if you pitch a story to us and you're rejected, that doesn't mean we've rejected you as a human being. <laughs> it means we don't like this one story idea, or we don't think this is going to uh, help with our mix. So you should not feel intimidated or that you would not apply again. That is totally fine. I suggest that once you don't get a proposal, um, you think a little deeper about what you want to do with climate labor. Again, I really uh, encourage you to look at the website though, that this, that is not the only way to write about the environment for Pulitzer. Uh, we have health grants and other grants that, uh, you know, would fit, you know, some of the proposals that I see that people actually have pitched directly to our work environment. And I've said, I, I don't think it's that story. I don't think it fits my fund. So, you know, we are open to general proposals and they go in a portal and, and we all look at them. All of us read these every week and we make a decision every Wednesday uh, if we can get through all of them, because sometimes we get uh, dozens of proposals. And last year, we we uh, approved over 200. And um, our, uh, you know, I try to tell people 
that I want to get you to yes, as I as Miguel knows, that if I can, and I think the story um, is good, I'll, I'll try to help. Miguel, there's a question. Can you recommend top sources for climate-related open data? I think that might be a better question for you. You go to more conferences than I do, I, and I think there's a great, there a great deal of sharing at these conferences, which is which I highly recommend. Yes, uh, I cannot think about one source, but I do know that the Reuters Institute has um, like an amazing list of professionals that may help you, which is public. Um, we have an amazing open data policy here in my country, so it is. Uh, relatively easy uh, to access um, to data, but this uh, changes uh, between neighbor, neighboring countries. So um, I have to think this through to give you a, a proper helpful uh, answer. So um, maybe um, you guys can share my contact with whoever asked your question and I promise to help you. Also, we have a rainforest initiative of which we have rainforest fellows, and we also have an ocean fellowship uh, with ocean yes. fellows. And so on our website, uh, and we have a, a data journalist and, and an editor who, that directly oversees the rainforest fund, and they have methodologies and lists of data that um, I've, I've spoken about this within Pulitzer that I think are, is trans transferable to uh, people who are interested in climate. So again, please go on the site, look for the Rainforest Fund Initiative, uh, RFJR, RFI, and um, also the Ocean Initiative, because they are um, you know, really putting together some very nice verticals on the site to, uh, to be a source. I also want to recommend uh, investigative reporters and editors in the US, it's IRE. And it has a data. It has um, some very good uh, recommendations for databases, mostly the U.S. But uh, there's also a, a GJIN, Global Journalism Investigative Network, that uh, some of my grantees from Africa, in particular, have been members of. And that too is a sharing of of the greater good. So I think that's uh, that can be helpful. And uh, again, there's a rainforest reporting toolkit uh, on our site. So look look on the site for that. And Gustavo Faleiros uh, is super generous. I mean, I've met with him in Italy, in Sao Paulo last year at a conference. He's super friendly. So I'm super sure that he, he will help you. Okay. I'm just looking quickly if there's any more questions that I've missed here. No, I think I'm good with that. Um, super. So, Mikael, what do you plan to do next? What's your, do you have any ways to have, further? Yes, uh, I always have a, a list of uh, stories that, uh, that, that are um, in the same line. So I have plenty of ideas, but currently I'm working on a guide to help journalists uh, from the Americas to um, have the capacity to build um, climate stories, collaborating with scientists using open data. So we are currently working on this guide, which as always, uh, um, it's going to be amazing once, once we finish it. Now it's a nightmare. <laughs> uh, but we're, we're doing that. We, we will start recording a podcast series and that will also touch on many of these subjects uh, in a couple of weeks. So we are pre-producing, writing, always, uh, always running, always running, Christina. We're always doing stuff. But yes, we have uh, uh, plenty of ideas. And once we survive uh, the guide, um, I'm sure I'm, at least I'm going to send you an email to, to tell you about uh, the ideas that we have because we're super excited. Great. And I want to I want to reach out to the freelancers in particular. I know rates have dropped this year uh, and, and I know many people have lost jobs, you know, particularly in the U.S. And I'm, I'm it just, just kind of keeps going the, the stress on journalists. 
and also freelancers. And we're very aware how hard it is, um, uh, both to, uh, both uh, in what you're getting paid. I see it a lot because in my other freelance activities, I see a real need uh, for editors. People aren't getting good direction. So in some instances, I think you are your own best friend on this. And I always, and the more methodical you are, just not methodologies, the more methodical you are in having a, what I call a whip list, work in progress list that you keep, that you maintain, and that you chip away on what is the most important thing you see in your region of coverage in the next year that you want to define what your journalism is about and or through through your journalism and i always say i judge reporters not on prizes and and things like that because prizes come your way and that, that just happens in your life it's your body of work and the body of work and 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 your value system and what you've pursued that's how you th should think about these proposals what are you contributing what are you learning who are you working with and what are you sharing and I think that kind of sustains you in these hard times in journalism. And, and that's what the Pulitzer Center hopes to do is help sustain people who are taking on really hard stories and, and trying to be innovative in a way that, um, you know, sometimes I have heard, you know, Christine, you can't do that. Oh, I think I can. Oh, I think I'll figure out a way. Or in a newsroom, you find people who want to take risks like you. And that's often how you do your best work, calculated risks and um, very well thought through risks. And that I think, you know, produces journalism that that you look back on and say, I'm glad I did that. Um, after applying, somebody is asking, uh, how soon will you be informed about the grant? It depends. Usually I would say the, at the longest two or three weeks. I try to do that within a week to 10 days if we have a robust discussion uh, during uh, our review sessions, which happen every uh, Wednesday. I suggest if you wanna be uh, looked at for that week, you get your proposal in by a, the Friday before that Wednesday. If you do it Monday, it's probably a little too late for that week. So that's why uh, it, will, it will take longer. Um, again, once you sign a grant, if you get a grant, there, then I kind of step away. I've given you the grant and administrators at the Pulitzer Center take over. They take care of all the paperwork. I don't handle any of that. None of the editors do. Uh, but we are here to, you know, I, I check in every three weeks or so with the grantees to see if how, how are things going. Well, thank you. I think we have... Uh, I think we've exhausted our questions and maybe our knowledge. <laughs> I don't know sure about that, um, but thank you so much. And um, don't forget to complete a survey before leaving. And the Pulitzer Center has put out the survey link there. And also within the chat, and I hope you've been following the webinar chat, they've been giving you uh, uh, some links to climate maps, probable futures climate maps, the Pulitzer Center uh, reporting toolkit, um, and we will make, uh, I think very early on, they put in the um, the links to the actual climate labor uh, stories that that I did in the um, in the opening statement. So feel free to follow up. Uh, we can provide more links. Uh, and we're very happy you joined. Thank you. And and Miguel, thank you. That was excellent. Oh, thank you so much, Christine. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And uh, you can always reach out. I'm here to help. So thanks. Great. And and they just put up the link to um, all the initiatives and the reporting grant. And that's, that's on the chat now. So until next time. Thank you all. Bye-bye.